as we've been going through the book of First John, just wanted to, uh, as we continue in chapter 3, share with you guys what's happening uh, with the Word of God, which never changes. Our society changes, uh, the restrictions and the quarantine that we're all under right now will change, but God's Word will never change. So if you would with me, let's unite our hearts in prayer before the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the promise of this day for what you've given to us. I pray that you would enlarge our hearts and our minds to understand your word and to just understand deeper what it is to have a relationship with you, the greatness of what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. I pray that you might make an impact on those who hear your word today and on me. Help us, Lord, to be more like you in every way. In Jesus' name. So as we've been going through the Word, we're actually here in chapter 3 of the book of John. Last week, previously here, what we went over was chapter 2. In chapter 1, he talks about light and darkness. He talks about love and hatred in chapter 2, 7 to 2, 17, and then truth and error from 2, 18 on until we get to the last chapter. He basically was discussing the Antichrist and those, the spirit of Antichrist, those who depart from the faith those who end up trying to deny Jesus Christ and his deity, and those who deceive the believers. Their attempt is to come and lure them away. Then we talked about the Holy Spirit, how he teaches and keeps it and reveals things to our hearts and helps us to understand more of what God wants us to know. So as we get into chapter 3, I'm so sorry, here at the, the very end of chapter 2, he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears... He may, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. He talks about us coming before him and knowing that we're his because we practice righteousness. We do those things which please God that he's instructed us to do. In 1 John 2, 5 and 6, we went over previously, he says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. We, uh, he, says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So there's an obligation on behalf of believers that say they follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to do those things that Jesus tells us to do. And in fact, it's the very proof that we're his, is that we do those things that please the Father that Jesus instructs us to do. So picking it up in chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. And beloved, now we are the children of God, but it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, meaning Christ, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For, his, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So if you're first time reading through this passage, you might say, uh-oh, because it says, the one who knows God doesn't sin. There's no way it can happen, because God's come in and taken away your sin. So if Jesus comes into your life, you don't sin anymore right? Well, there are people who profess that. On the other hand, 
they have trouble with all the rest of the scriptures, and they also have trouble looking into the original language, which we're going to talk about what it was that John was trying to say, or the Holy Spirit was saying through John, and we'll look at it a little closer. I titled this, Are You Adopted? As you can see, a black sheep in a family of white sheep, I imagine it always wonders, was I adopted? I don't seem to fit in. I don't look like them. Uh, they know I don't look like them, and they treat me as though I'm different. And you might be a black sheep. You might be somebody who doesn't fit in. And uh, I don't know about you, but I had two brothers growing up, and my one brother had red hair, blue eyes, and freckles. My other brother had blonde hair and green eyes, and I have brown eyes and brown hair. And so the question was, okay, which one of us is adopted, or are we all three adopted? And I, I don't know, it's an unusual question that people ask. If you don't look like your parents, you have to wonder, am, am I a natural born child, or am I someone who's been adopted? Well, Jesus answered that question for us, and John is going to emulsify it. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, which is a title we certainly don't deserve. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. So we're like that black sheep here in this world. We don't fit in, and truly we have been adopted and we are not of the flock of this world. We are his. So, behold what manner of love. And the original language is a bit more clear. It says, behold how foreign, unusual, and strange, and out of this world beyond understanding is the love of God that he has bestowed upon us. I don't know about you, but it's something I'm not sure I understand the depths of how much God loves us. Because I certainly would not take my only son and willingly sacrifice him, come in person and die for a bunch of people that hated me. And yet that's what God did. Behold, what matter of love, how far and how unusual, how out of this world it is, this love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. People very glibly say we're all his children. We're all his creation, but we are not all his children. Children are different. So, it says, God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us in Romans 5, 8. You know, it's, it, we do good to those who do good to us. We find it easy to love those who love us back or love people we like or enjoy or respect. But to love those who hate you, who despise you, who want nothing to do with you, and this is what God did for us that he loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for our sin. While we were still sinners, while we hated his guts, while we were spitting at him and cursing him, he died for us. If, if you can understand the depths of that, I think maybe you'll understand the depths of our thanksgiving that we should be giving with our life and, and everything and every breath and everything that we do. It says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7, But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus." So God did what he did for us because he loved us. Not because there was anything in us to love, but because he himself is love. And it's an amazing thing. And he did it so that he might show us off as a trophy of his grace to say, here is someone that I took and that I restored to a right relationship with myself. And look at what they've done. I think about Job, the book of Job, when the devil goes up to God and, uh, you know, the Lord says, where you been? And he says, well, I'm on the earth running around, going to and fro, and, and he says, have you considered my servant Job? And of course, Job was doing a good job, and God was boasting on Job, saying Job's doing a good job, because he's faithful, and he does what I tell him to do. I think about how we are a trophy of God's, and how he shows us off, and forever and ever and ever, you will be God's trophy, where he says, look, this is a person that I have redeemed, and look how they have changed. If you're a person who knows Jesus Christ, he did this because he loves you and he cares about you. And he is going to put you on display, as it were, as a trophy for all eternity. Behold what manner of love that God has for us. I think of the story of 
the prodigal son, who was one of two sons, the younger, and says, Father, give me what you owe me. Basically, when you die, I, I want that portion that belongs to me. And the father does it. He gives him what's owed. And the son goes off and takes that money, and he just blows it on wild living until he has nothing. That's a picture of us. That's the picture of our lives, where God creates us, and basically we take everything that he's given to us, and we want it up front, and we want to make the choices as to how we run our lives, and we run it into the ground every single time. And yet, he gets at the bottom of the barrel where he has nothing, and he's feeding pigs, and he's wanting to eat the food he's feeding to the pigs. He's so hungry. And it says that he came to himself, which I, I love the, such a descriptive term. He came to himself and said, don't even my father's servants have bread to eat and they have a place to sleep? And they're, they're treated much better than the way I'm being treated. I know. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him, Father, I have sinned against you and against God. And I am not worthy to be called your son. Please let me be one of your hired hands, me, be your servant. Of course, the father wraps him up in love, gets a puts shoes on his feet because he didn't have shoes. He puts a, a coat on him because he wasn't dressed. And he puts a ring on his finger and he says, kill the fatted calf because we're going to have a party. My son that was once dead is now alive. He was lost and now he's found. That's the picture of us. What matter of love is this? How foreign, how completely different than the way that we love, which is always reciprocal and usually has strings attached to it. God so loved us that he gave his only son and whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life because of his love. Not because of anything we deserved or anything we could be or anything he would dress us up to be, but because he loves us for who we are, which is an amazing thing. And if that's the case, we should love one another, shouldn't we? So this reminds me of that story. What matter of love is this, that a father would give away everything he's worked for and see his son squander it and not give him a speech, not give him a beating, not make him work for it, not make him uh, feel bad about it or, you know, throw him guilty looks every once in a while, but to receive him completely. And it says that the father saw him while he was still a far way off. And that's the way, that's the way God is. And you might be that person who's a far way off today, but know that God sees you, know that God watches you, and know God waits with open arms to receive you back, if that's the case. That we should be called the children of God. It says in Romans 8.29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So God's picking of you and predestinating you and making a home for you and preparing a place for you is all about him conforming us to his image. That we are like Jesus in the way that we think and what we feel and how we behave. That's the whole aim of why God made us his children, so that we might be like him in every way, conform to the image of Jesus Christ. It's always interesting when somebody comes up and says, you know, you, you look like somebody I know. Uh, you know, I guess everybody's got a doppelganger somewhere in this world, somebody that looks like them. Uh, I've been accused of looking like all kinds of people. But when somebody comes up and says, you remind me of Jesus, you can have no better compliment than that. That you remind them of Jesus and that the image of God is in you because you're his kid, because you're his child. Would to God that that would be the case for all of us. That someone could say, you remind me of God. You remind me of Jesus Christ himself. And what you say and how you feel and how you think and the way that you go about your life, you remind me of Jesus. There's no greater compliment than to be called one of his children because you look like the Father and act like the Father. There were those who tried to be like God, and they boasted that they had Abraham as their ancestor, the teachers in ancient Israel that were arguing with Jesus. And they were trying to say that they had never been slaves, even though we know they were. And they said, you know, we don't need to be free. We have everything we need. We're related to Abraham, so we're in. And then they said, well, we're related to God, you know, we're God's chosen people. And they boasted in that, and then they just lived sloppy lives, and they just lived in the flesh. And, and they boasted that they were going to get into heaven because of those things. Jesus came down on them really, really hard. In John 8, 44 to 47, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, or he speaks of his own native language. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? Jesus flat out asked them, which, which of you can find anything wrong with what I'm saying or, or my life? And he says, if I tell you the truth, then why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. He accused these religious leaders, these guys that were on the highest portion of the totem pole, claiming that they were related to God because they were related to Abraham and they had a relationship with God and they knew the law of Moses by heart. These guys were boasting of all these things and yet in their heart they wanted to murder Jesus when they told him the truth. That's really what reveals who you belong to, whether you're a child of God or a child of the devil. And by the way, there's no middle ground. You're one or the other, and Jesus makes it real clear, and in John, he makes it real clear. He says, because it did not know him, therefore the world does not know us. You see, if we're the children of God, and if we look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, think like Jesus, feel like Jesus, people will reject us as well. Uh, hopefully not because we're weird, but because we're like Jesus, and they're going to reject us because they rejected him first. And I, I find that always interesting when you're sharing the gospel, you're sharing your testimony, and somebody just flat out rejects, and you, you can't even reason with them. So don't be surprised when people reject you because of Jesus. You just have to keep going. You just keep doing what you were. Jesus went into his own hometown of Nazareth, and he began to read from the book of Isaiah. And as he read, he, he says, I have come to set the captives free and set at liberty... Uh, he, he said all of these things, and he says, these things are fulfilled within your hearing today in this place. And Jesus began to share who he was. And they all got angry. And they forced him out the door, and a crowd of people sent him towards a cliff. And they were going to throw him over the cliff because they thought he was blaspheming. They thought he was claiming to be God, and he wasn't. And yet we know he was. He was telling the truth the entire time. But they thought he had overstepped and overstated and so they pushed him up against the cliff. And when he came right down to it, Jesus just walked right through the crowd. And they said absolutely nothing. Because it wasn't his time yet. And until it's your time yet, you're invincible. COVID, virus, or, or whatever. So just keep going and don't be surprised that people reject your words because you say the same thing as Jesus. In John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, Speaking of Jesus, it says he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, that means his own creation, and his own, which is his own people, his very family, did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. So Jesus himself, although he was the creator, and everything was created for him and by him, and in him all things hold together, it says in Colossians chapter 1, he came and no one who knew who he was. Even his disciples doubted who he was on most of his ministry. So don't be surprised if people who are close to you, maybe family members, maybe people that you work with, maybe your neighbor, maybe even people in church, won't necessarily receive the thing you say. But the way they react to truth will tell you who they belong to. The scripture teaches us that. Beloved, we are now the children of God. So now he states it as a certainty. We're, this is something I'm going to state now. I'm not going to just say isn't it amazing. But we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As adopted children out of this world, it says that we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, which is uh, one one fifty fifth of a second. Actually, I heard it stated today. It's it's an amazing thing that we're going to be translated from a physical body to a spiritual body when our spot when our spirit comes out of our body and he gives us a new one, and we will be like him. And I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but I believe what the scripture says. And I wonder, you ever wonder about what it's going to be like in heaven? 
or what God's going to have you do. I've heard people say, yeah, I'm going to be in charge of some planets or, you know, they're going to be in charge of certain things like there's some kind of labor union up in heaven. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's fun, I guess, to imagine and use a sanctified imagination as, you don't, as long as you don't go crazy and get too egotistical. But what is it going to be like when we go to heaven? I don't know. But I know that I'm going to be like him, and I, that's the thing I'm looking forward to most. I want to be less like me and more like him all the time. And there are, there are temptations that arise within my heart. There are weaknesses in my body. There's aches in my back. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to leave this place. I'm, I'm ready to get a new body. Um, but what will I be like? It's not necessarily what is going to be like in heaven, but I wonder often who will I be? When my personality, when my spirit is united with Christ and I become like him, and yet I'm very much individually me, what's that going to be like? What about you? What will you shed like an old skin or an old pair of torn jeans? What will you have shed and what is it that you will have put on when you get to heaven? Because it says that we are the children of God. Is that yet revealed who we shall be. It's, it's a rather interesting thing. Who we shall be. In other words, we're, we're not completed. We're still in process, but it's going to happen radically as soon as we see the Lord. And I, I find that amazing that just being in the presence of Jesus is what's going to change us. And we will be like him because we will see him as he is. I don't know how that is. It's, it's almost like when the sun comes up, you'll be warm because the sun will hit you and that's going to change everything. It's like that, I think, going to heaven. And I look forward to it and my imagination kind of reels. With, I wonder what that's going to be like. Not because I deserve it or, you know, I, I, I ran the race and, and I'm first in line and there's a big receiving line. But because God actually gets to receive each one of us home as the fruition of his love for each one of us. And I just think... That's an amazing thought to me. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us. And everyone who has this hope in him, in Jesus Christ, purifies himself just as he, meaning Jesus, is pure. So in, in hoping for all of this, and as looking forward to this, this imminent return of Jesus Christ, this absolute certainty that it could come at any moment, which the whole church has lived with ever since the very first century, looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ at any moment. Because he said, I'll come like a thief in the night, but it won't surprise you because I already told you. So it shouldn't surprise you if I told you there's a surprise. It's like somebody telling you there's a surprise party that you already know about. So it won't surprise us. In Psalm 46.10, we're told to be still and know that I am God. It's... Uh, it's a really good passage for us to just be still and know that God is and that he's here and he's intimately interested in everything that you're thinking, feeling, and going through in your life. That's who God is. That's what it is to be still. Don't be so busy. Don't be running around doing this, doing that, going here, going there. Be still and know that I am God. We need to practice that on a regular basis minute by minute almost, to remember. It says here in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus said that to his disciples the night that they came and they arrested him. And he was telling his dis disciples to stay watch and stay up and pray and be vigilant. And of course, three times they let him down. For us to remember the coming of Jesus at any moment, is something that purifies our life. It's something that removes compromise. It's something that will chase away temptation. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I, I guess I better stop smoking because I don't want to. I don't want to take a drag of my cigarette and then get raptured and I have to hold my breath all of eternity not to let the Lord know I was smoking or you know some stupid thing like that. But to remember that God is always there to be still and know that He's here and He knows everything that's going on changes us. And it purifies us so that we don't do the stupid things we would otherwise do in our flesh. We live and walk in the Spirit, as the Scripture says. Remembering our temporal state and knowing that we will see Him soon helps us remember the spiritual battle around us 
and purify our behavior. So uh, just kind of summing up, that's what it is to remember God's presence and also that he will be reappearing. It also helps me to slow down when I'm in traffic because Jesus is watching me. It helps me make a complete stop at stop signs even though there's nobody on the road uh, during the quarantine um, because Jesus is always watching. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to remember that. I want to do everything with eternity in mind. When I do this thing or I go this direction or make this decision, will I be standing before God embarrassed as to what I did? Will I feel sorry for what I did? Or will I be proud of the decision I made? And thinking about everything that we do in light of eternity is something that causes us to live differently. And like every day, live every day like it's your last, because it may be. Live every day, live in the moment, live it like it's the last day on earth, because it very well could be. And don't you want it to mean something? If it was your last day, what would you do with it? That's what you should be doing. So, Jesus is watching. So make sure that you're living that way. The scripture says in verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So that's a definition or a synonymous word for sin. And you know that he was manifest, meaning Jesus, manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Does it make you a little uncomfortable? Whoever sins has neither seen him nor has known, known him. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. The scripture, in when it says sin, it's talking about habitual lifestyle. It's talking about an unbridled, self-willed rebellion. This is something that is a decided course of life, uh, life where you have not had any kind of a conversion experience or a relationship with God, but you just continue to live the same. If you say, hey, yeah, I became a Christian. Well, how long ago? Well, 10 years ago. Well, why are you still doing all the same stupid things you did 10 years ago? Uh, well, if Jesus came to manifest our sin, and if, if you commit lawlessness and lawlessness is sin, then why is it that you're living in sin and you call yourself a Christian? I don't know about you, but it's not the first time I've wondered whether somebody's saved or not, or even wondered if I've saved. I read through the scripture, I wonder if I am sometimes. But this defiance of governing or wisdom, this is what lawlessness is, rebellion against submission. So if you have that in your heart, and that's basically the mantra of your life, you should ask a question and say, do I really know the Lord Jesus Christ and have I submitted my life to him? Or am I just kind of trying to put a new patch on an old garment, trying to throw Jesus into the mix of my life? There's none of that. John 8, 34 says, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. If you have decided to live in that sort of lifestyle where if it feels good, do it. If, if it's going to get, uh, you know, the guy with the biggest toys wins, uh, I'm going to do what I want. And if it feels good, do it. If you're going to live by all of that, then don't call yourself a Christian because you do Christ a disservice. You're either his child and you look like him, you talk like him, you feel like him, you think like him, or you live in sin and you don't claim to be a Christian. You can't have a foot in each camp. And that's essentially what John's trying to unravel here and explain to us. It says that he was manifested to take away our sin. In Psalm 103, verses 8 to 12, the whole psalm is great, but I just took a portion of it. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. I'm so glad that the scripture uses east to west. Because if you keep going east, you'll never go west. You'll always be going east, and always going east, and always going east. And if you're going west, you'll never go east. You'll always go west. And they never connect. They never touch. If he said he separated as far as the north is from the south, you eventually go north and eventually come south. So there's an end. But east to west, essentially, there is no end. Uh, the problem is we, we don't understand that very often, and we don't forgive ourselves very well. Or we, it's not that we should forgive ourselves, it's that we should accept God's forgiveness. Uh, we don't have the right to forgive ourselves because we're not qualified. But Jesus is, and he assures us that he does if we've accepted Christ. As far as the east is from the west, 
He takes away our sins. In Micah 7.19, it says, He will again have compassion on us, and he will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. And you may have heard that scripture quoted before, into the sea of forgetfulness, and he remembers them no more. He throws them to the bottom of the sea. If you know anything about the depths of the sea, there are places we can't go because it's just too deep. And that's where our sins go. So uh, I'm glad for that. If, if I had to pick a place, um, that would be a good place. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25 says, For who himself, who is Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by, those, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So I'm grateful to God that he has done that for us, that he has uh, taken away our sins, thrown them in the depths of the sea, and they're gone. They're no longer upon us because they went on Jesus when he was on the cross. And so when somebody else sins against us, we're to do the same thing. We're to throw it upon the Lord. We're to forgive other people. The problem is that we always tend to go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. We tend to pull up people's past sins and remind them of it. Uh, we say we forgive and then we bring the thing up again, which is not forgiveness at all. God never brings up our sins. When he says they're planted at the bottom of the ocean, they're planted at the bottom of the ocean. And that includes anyone else's sins. That's where they belong. They shouldn't be readily upon our lips. They shouldn't be quickly upon our minds. And they certainly shouldn't be uh, rehearsed and, and like something we give back when we're angry at someone. So that's what real forgiveness is. It says, whoever abides in him, who is Jesus, does not sin. So if you claim to know Jesus, you can't sin, right? That means you can't do anything wrong. You can't do anything wrong. We know that sin is lostness. So if you roll through a stop sign, you don't know Jesus, right? Well, that apparently what it says, right? I mean, when you first look at it, that's what it appears to say. But it says, in the present perfect tense, which means there's a habitual practice of sin in your life, there's a continual persistence, and an unaltered course of sin in your life. So it's this perpetual, unchanged behavior where you say, yeah, 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 I've, been, I've known Jesus for years, but you still continually do all these stupid things and you have no remorse whatsoever, no change of course. You're living in sin. You're living according to the sinful nature. How could you say that you're a child of God? And it's pretty clear. Uh, if, if there is persistent sin in your life, there's something to do about that. We confess it before God. We agree with what he says about our sin. And we ask for forgiveness, and we ask for the grace and strength for repentance. So we can turn around, and we certainly have the power to do that. Because not only did he take away the power of sin in our lives, but he took away the slavery of it that we have to do what it tells us to do. We're not a slave to our minds. We're not a slave to our society. And we're certainly not a slave to our bodies because God has freed us up. So it says in Romans 6, 16 to 18, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God, be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine in which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We no longer are slaves or addicted to sin. We're now addicted to righteousness. We have to do those things that are right because otherwise we can't live with ourselves. We can't live with God and we certainly can't live with one another. We have a new nature, a new heart, a new, a new life, and a new master because sin doesn't tell us what to do anymore. So when it says, whoever abides in him does not sin, it doesn't mean that you don't ever do anything wrong because the scriptures are clear that there is a way to be able to deal with those infractions. And what happens is we always are getting perfected and cleansed. And you might not be able to confirm or deny whether you agree with that statement, but I can tell you that it's true. I have a question for you. Who, who are you submitting yourself to? Who is it that you obey? Is it the flesh? Is it society? Is it people who put pressure on you? Or is it God himself and what he's disclosed in his word? So the question is, who do you obey? That tells you who your master is. The one you obey is the one that you're the master. That who is your master? So it's a pretty clear cut. And it's this present tense. Of no one is sinless, but we should always be sinning less and less. That it should be something that's always less and less a part of our lives. 
And when we practice righteousness, when we do those things, especially when you're first a Christian, it's really difficult to kind of get the hang of this. But eventually you do, and the Lord reveals more and more to you, and you begin to do those things, and it's a whole lot easier, like walking is for a child. And it's this persistent practice that makes permanent. It doesn't make perfect, because none of us will ever be perfect, but it does make permanent in our lives. So, our behavior reveals who we belong to. So, are you wrestling with sin, or are you cohabitating with it? Because sin shouldn't be something that you put up with, or you, you just let rule your life anymore. It's something that you should be wrestling with, not just rolling over and, and giving in to. And he says here in verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, meaning Christ, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For his purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So it just makes sense. Just like you don't find babies in eggs, you don't find oranges in apples, you don't find money on a tree. None of those things. And you will not find somebody who says they're a Christian and they live in sin. It's just not going to happen. You will find somebody that lives in righteousness who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the very proof that they're his kid because they look like him, they smell like him, they behave like him, and they feel like him. In Matthew 7, verses 17 to 18, Jesus says this, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. He's not saying a good person can't do anything bad or fall short. He's not saying that a bad person can't do good once. He's trying to say that it's not your nature to do. You can't keep up the show. You can put up a pretense and you can put a smiley face on, but it, your deeds, your behavior will reveal who you, live, who you live for and who's your master. Whoever has been born of God does not sin continually, perpetually, uh, always continuing in sin. A real Christian doesn't do that. You, you've heard of a carnal Christian? The scripture doesn't teach that. It says you're in or you're not. You're a good tree or you're a bad tree. It's quite simple. And, his, and this is why you can't sin. For his seed remains in him. That's the Spirit of God inside of you. You can't do what you would because of the Spirit of God. And he cannot sin perpetually, continually, and as a, as a present tense, because he has been born of God, because you're his kid. And in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So the secret ingredient of why you can't continue the same way is the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. If, if you have not come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and had the Spirit of God come into you and had a radical change in your life, then you don't know it. If you did, then you know it because your life changes and you practice righteousness and you strive and you battle and you put sin down in your life and you don't yield to it like uh, you know some pussycat that's going to knock you over. Present perfect tense habitually, practicing sin or continually being persistent or having an unaltered course in it. That's not something that's part of the Christian's life. If it is, you've got a problem, you should talk to somebody and you should get with God because he wants to remove it from your life. It's not like Jesus and the devil will have an arm wrestling contest. Uh, God's already won, and the devil's losing ground daily, all the time. So it's a battle he's always losing. What happens when we come to Jesus Christ and we believe on him as our Savior and Lord, that he is who he said he was, we believe in all of it, what happens is we get a new master. We get a new nature. We get a new heart. We get a new mind. Unfortunately, our software is still needing updates constantly, and we're always having to be rinsed through. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you're a Christian who's been walking along and yet you find that there's a stubborn stain in your soul that you need to get rid of, 1 John tells us how to deal with that as well. We confess our sins, and that's we, we, we agree with God. That's what it means. It's, it's homo, homo, homeologus, which is that we say the same thing. We say the same word as him. And in 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. 
if any, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate, that, that's a lawyer, by the way, somebody who comes alongside with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So if you're not living a righteous life, if you haven't given your life to Christ and say, I'm going to do God, I'm going to do anything you want me to do. You tell me what to do and, you know, I'll do it. You say jump, I'll say how I. If you haven't come to that place where he's your Lord, which means he tells you what to do, and he's your Savior, which means you're not a slave to sin anymore, then you don't know it, but you can. And it's just as simple as asking him into your life. You can pray and just say, God, I, I need you as my boss. I need you to open my eyes. I need a new birth. I need a spiritual life, and I just don't have one. Come into my life and give me all those things that your word has promised me that you will give to me, and I will, I will be yours. And it's an amazing thing when God comes into a life and changes a person, and it can be you. It can be you today. If you want to pray that prayer to God and ask him to come in and believe that Jesus took away your sins, you can be saved. So, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So my question to you is, are you adopted? Have you been taken up as a black sheep of this world and has God claimed you as his own to cleanse from the inside out, to remake you and make you like himself? If he has, you have a tremendous blessing. You have the greatest gift that anyone can give or receive. If not, you can have it today. And I pray that you might, in Jesus' name.